I think these next two games are, are culture games. Um, you know, they're, the games are for trophies, and, and I think our, our guys know that. And, it, and like I said or two weeks ago, it's another opportunity to go out there and, and, and show what we got. Um, you know, you can't take any game for granted, even if even if that's you know you don't even make it to a bowl game. You can't really even focus on that. It's it's one game at a time. And, uh, you know, Wisconsin's a good team. It's for defensively, you know, they're always tough up front, physical. Um, but that's what we like. It's another good challenge for the D-line. Um, but, yeah, no, we're, we're excited about these next two games. They're, they're big games. You know, these, this could change a lot. That was Nebraska defensive lineman Casey Rogers describing what these next two games are about for the Huskers. He's not wrong. I know some people don't like that word, culture. But it's kind of tough to ignore in the Big Ten. P.J. Fleck ruffled some feathers earlier this year when he claimed Minnesota's win over Nebraska was, quote, culture over skill, close quote. I'm not interested in rehashing all of that, but I didn't think he was wrong either. That game, with the benefit of hindsight, is kind of the moment everything flipped in 2021 for, for the Huskers. These final two games for Nebraska, however, represent a chance to get some of that back. Look around the West Division. And culture over skill sort of defines it. Minnesota and Northwestern are that way. But Wisconsin and Iowa are probably the gold standard for that approach. That type of football. Winning consistently in this game tends to be about one of two things. It's about talent. Um, we all know that. Recruited high left level and you'll, you'll probably win a bunch of games. And as long as that recruiting maintains that high level, the wins will probably keep coming. Or, if you've got some recruiting challenges, a culture advantage can also produce pretty consistent results. That's where Nebraska's trying to get to. If it's going to consistently compete in this conference, it simply has to be able to meet the level of execution programs like the next two Nebraska will face have established. Can the Huskers do it this week in Madison? You're listening to the I-80 Preview Podcast, Huskers Badgers Edition. I'm Hale Varsity Managing Editor Brandon Vogel. Let's talk some football. Nebraska takes on number 19 Wisconsin in a 2.30 p.m. Central Time game on ABC this week. We'll kick things off here with a look at the opening line. The Badgers opened minus 10 on Sunday at Circus Sports. It was down to minus 9 midweek. At minus 10, it felt like there was a, a point or two penalty for, for Nebraska's, well, almost full scale minus one uh, changes to its offensive staff during the Huskers bye week probably should be Uh, that, that poses a lot of questions about this game. I thought the, this would open closer to Wisconsin minus seven, uh, but I might've just been wrong about that. We'll look at a couple of the power ratings for these two teams coming in Um, SP plus an ESPN measure has Wisconsin with a 22.5 rating, which is fourth nationally. And SP Plus has been pretty consistent on Wisconsin, even when it started one and three. It didn't, I don't think it ever dropped the Badgers outside of the top 10. Defense is just too good. And the offense eventually came around. So that might sound high. It it probably is about as high as you'll find Wisconsin uh, rated anywhere. But there are reasons for that, which we'll get into in the second half. Nebraska is still holding pretty firm at 13.5 with it for its SP plus rating. That's been pretty much the case for the last five or six weeks, despite the fact that Nebraska hasn't won a game uh, <laughs> since, since Northwestern. Kind of hard to believe, um, but it has been that long. Use those two power ratings, add in two and a half points for, for home field advantage, and that leaves Wisconsin minus 11 and a half. So higher than the current spread FPI has it a little bit lower. It doesn't view Wisconsin quite as highly as SP plus does. Uh, it has the Badgers with a 14.1 rating, which is still ninth. Um, so far better than the polls have the Badgers at this point, Nebraska's at 8.7 and it's been kind of hanging around in that 25 to 30 range this week. It's the Huskers are rated 28th mash those numbers together. You've got a FPI projected line of Wisconsin minus eight. The lowest projection in, in Nebraska's favor at the prediction tracker.com, which has over 60 different predictions for, for lack of a better term on every college football game each week, uh, still has Wisconsin by five. So 
there's not some mystery computer system out there that's that's projecting a Nebraska win. Not that I think any of us expected there to be. So that's kind of the general setup for for Saturday. Wisconsin's a deserving favorite. How big a favorite do they deserve to be? Like I said, I started at a touchdown looking at some of these power ratings through the week. Probably deserve to be a little bit higher than that, which is where where the Badgers find themselves. Let's look at three key players for for Wisconsin. It's been a, an interesting season to to unpack for the Badgers. Number one on the list, I think. Well, it, number one on the list is the defense as a whole. But I'm not actually using that. The the number one individual I chose is running back Braylon Allen. Pretty crazy story. Uh, he is could still be in high school at this point. He reclassified from 2022 class to enroll early at Wisconsin had just 12 carries through Wisconsin's first four games. Since then he's averaging 17.7 carries per game, 7.4 yards on those carries and 1.3 rushing touchdowns per game. He's really enabled the Badgers to get back to, I think what they want to do and what they in this particular season definitely needed to do have more on that in a little bit. Number two on my list Pickle Wisconsin linebacker. I mean, it's it's kind of ridiculous the level of linebackers this program just churns out. But I went with inside linebacker Leo Chanel. He's a Buckus Award semifinalist, leads the team with 81 tackles, and that's in just eight games. So he missed two uh, during the season. He also has 15 tackles for loss, including six and a half sacks. So you'll hear his name pretty often on Saturday. Third, I'm going to go with tight end Jake Ferguson. If Nebraska can force some passing downs, which I think is a key question in this game, Ferguson is most often Wisconsin's answer. He leads the team with 31 receptions, and early in the year when when things weren't going so well for the Badgers, that offense frequently looked like it's third and seven. Uh, What do we do? (laughs) Let's just try to get the ball to Jake Ferguson. And... It's, it's, it's not a bad strategy by, by any means. Wisconsin gets pretty creative in how it gets him the ball. And even though it's kind of gone on this six-game winning streak that it is currently on, by dialing back the offense and getting around that, doesn't change the type of player that Ferguson is, obviously. And should Nebraska get into some of those high-leverage situations, a third and long, he's the guy you got to watch out for. Flip this around and and look at key players for the Huskers on Saturday. Number one on my list is linebacker Luke Reimer. Needs four tackles to hit 100 on the season. That's only happened at Nebraska once in the Frost era. Muhammad Barry had did it in 2018. But wait, there's more. Second on my list of key Huskers is Reimer's running mate, linebacker Nick Henrich. He needs 13 tackles to hit 100, so he's probably not going to get there against Wisconsin. Uh, There probably won't be that many plays in this game if it goes the way I think it could go, but he's got a great shot to get there by by the end of the year. If that happens, it would be the first time Nebraska's had two players with 100-plus tackles in a season since 2003. We know what kind of game this is. It's a game for linebackers, so... We got two linebackers right off the top here for Nebraska. For the third player to watch, I'm going to go to the offensive side of the football. I'm going to pick Ramir Johnson. Um, this game is an interesting puzzle for Nebraska for a variety of reasons, uh, particularly when you look at the offense. The piece it has to have, in my opinion, is a back who can do the dirty work, but also maybe hit for a big play via the rush or the pass, which we've seen with Johnson, particularly of late. He's clearly emerged as Nebraska's best bet. Ron Brown is stepping in to coach the running backs over these remaining two weeks for for Nebraska. And I think that's that's probably a good thing for Johnson. Um, Everything I've heard is that Brown was kind of was was a pretty big factor in keeping him involved. You know, he started the season near the bottom of the running back depth chart. And by the time the Oklahoma game rolled around, it was pretty clear that he was headed towards the top and he has been there since that point. So that'll do it for the first half. 
Here's Rusty Dawkins with the forecast for this week's game. You can find Rusty on Twitter at, at @huskerweather and check hailvarsity.com for updates throughout the week. Hi there, everyone. I'm meteorologist Rusty Dawkins for Hail Varsity, and this is the IED Preview Podcast Forecast, and we're headed to Madison, Wisconsin on Saturday to play, play the Badgers on November 20th. And, you know, the average high this time of year in Wisconsin, I was thinking it might be on the cold side. It's 46. That's not bad. The average low in the lower 30s. And you know what? I think that's about where we're going to be uh, for the forecast. So let's start off early in the morning. If you're out there, if you're out there early and you're doing some tailgating, 8 a.m., temperatures in the middle 30, sure, chill in the air, partly cloudy skies, south wind 5 to 10 miles per hour. By 10 a.m., I think we crack the 40-degree temperature range. We'll be right around 40 degrees by 10 o'clock, partly cloudy at southwest wind. And I think by noon, the middle 40s, partly cloudy skies, southwest wind of 5 to 15 miles per hour. I think that's kind of where we level off for high temperatures for the day. By about noon, uh, I think middle 40s, partly cloudy, that southwest wind at 5 to 15. Now, as we get it towards kickoff, which is a 2.30 kick, uh, middle 40s. Again, that's right around the average high, uh, partly cloudy skies and a light southwest wind. Uh, no precipitation in this forecast. will remain partly cloudy through the game by halftime. Temperatures dropping a little bit into the lower 40s. I think by the fourth quarter, we'll be right around 40 degrees with partly cloudy sky. So overall, this is a really nice day uh, for a football game. Not a lot of wind, partly the mostly cloudy skies, and temperatures generally in the 40s. So we'll take it, especially in Wisconsin in November. If you want more updates, and if there are any updated forecast details, I'll have those on my uh, social media pages. That's at Husker Weather on Facebook and Twitter. You can also find my uh, personal uh, forecasts on uh, Rusty WX. And as, as always, we'll have some updates on Hale Varsity and all of their social media channels. Go Big Red! Statistically speaking, from a yards per play perspective, Nebraska has had two of the best games against the Wisconsin defense this century. The Huskers averaged 7.6 yards per play in 2018 and 8.2 in Lincoln in 2019. But the Badgers won comfortably both times. In more normal circumstances, I suppose, maybe that's the angle of this game. Nebraska and Wisconsin didn't get a play last year. So th- those two games are the last time out for, for both of these programs against one another. And you'd look at it and say, well, Nebraska's had some strong offensive games against Wisconsin when not many teams do. Is that what's going to unfold this time? The decision to change coaches before the end of the season, I think obviously changes that a bit. Perhaps that's why Frost said this week, it's going to be an ugly game. It's going to be a Big Ten game in November. Given that the offensive staff at this point is Frost, tight ends coach Sean Becton, and then the team of analysts moving in coaching roles, what will we see from Nebraska offensively? What do we need to see for NU to get a win? We'll dive into that now and kick off the second half here. I'm going to start with Nebraska's defense. The Huskers have to force Wisconsin into passing downs. It's important in every game. It's an advantage anytime it happens. But with how Wisconsin is playing of late, I think it's absolutely essential on Saturday. Wisconsin realized after a 1-3 and start that asking quarterback Graham Mertz to drop back and throw a ton wasn't going to work. He had 37 attempts in the loss to Penn State. That wasn't a very high-scoring game. That's, That's a lot of pass attempts. He had 41 in the loss to Notre Dame which was a little bit stranger. Um, Wisconsin got behind late, kind of had to play catch up. That one's a little bit more explainable. No matter. Since then, he's been over 20 pass attempts in a game just twice. I think as high as 22. So not drastically over either. The emergence of running back Braylon Allen has has really allowed for that, for Paul Christ and, and Wisconsin staff to to kind of take some things, I think, off of Mertz's plate. Black shirts have to be ready to grind here. It's been very good at limiting big plays. This week, when you remove garbage time, it's first nationally in rushing explosiveness allowed. And Wisconsin comes into the game as one of the least explosive teams, whether via the rush or the pass, in the country. But it's a strong success rate team. The Badgers rank 38th in success rate, 36th on rushing plays. Four-yard gains are this offense 
at peace. You kind of got to look at it that way. Wisconsin offense is in standard downs. So those would be the downs where the offense is on schedule and has the advantage. It's in those downs 73.6% of the time, which is 10th nationally. If this offense can go first and 10, second and six, third and three, Nebraska's probably in for a pretty long day. The best way to change that is with tackles for loss and stuffed runs, basically plays in the backfield. And you know Wisconsin's going to be pretty run heavy. Problem there is, or the challenge there at least, is that Wisconsin ranks eighth in opponent havoc rate, which is tackles for loss, passes defended, um, and ter- and takeaways. Wisconsin's also 35th in opponent stuff rate, which isn't a surprise given the history of O-line play in Madison. They just don't, they don't go backwards a ton. Nebraska needs to figure out a way to make that happen. We're not talking about, I mean, you'd take it if you could get it. You're probably not talking about a dominant performance where it seems like the black shirts are just in the Badgers backfield constantly, but you got to bring those, those numbers down or up in this case, uh, talking about Nebraska's defense and its ability to, to be a little bit disruptive. I, Nebraska's kind of calling card this year has been be very sound, keep things in front of you and don't give up the big play. And it's executed that to a really high level against Wisconsin, which isn't producing a ton of big plays. Anyway, you got to shift your focus a little bit And it becomes, if you go into a normal game against, say, the average college football offense, limiting big plays is is a really viable way forward. Against Wisconsin, they're going to try and grind things out. So Nebraska needs to be ready, particularly that front seven, to stand up and win its, its fair share of plays. Second key for Saturday, where's Nebraska going to get it's big plays. So this is kind of the other side of the coin to what we're talking about with Nebraska's defense outside of Athens, Georgia, this Wisconsin defense is probably the best in the country, excluding garbage time. It ranks first in total success rate, rushing success rate and passing success rate. Nothing comes easy against this Badgers team. Defensively, they're winning 70% of their plays which means they're holding opposing offenses to a 30% success rate. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. It's not a total surprise then that much of opponent's production has come on explosive plays. This is kind of usually the yin and yang of, of well, either offense or defense. You, the best, best, best teams in the country, um, you know, Alabama in recent years, Clemson, maybe Georgia this year, are capable of doing both, no matter which side of the ball you're talking about. Staying on schedule and getting explosive plays or keeping teams off schedule and preventing them. I mean, that's what elite football looks like. The vast majority of the sport, however, falls into some gray area where they're better at one than the other. This Wisconsin defense is definitely sort of similar to the offense. I call it a success rate offense. It's a success rate defense as well. They just keep teams off schedule really, really consistently. Big plays, however, is where you've got some room to work. They can be pretty volatile. Like you can't just go in and say, well, we're going to get some explosive plays now. Because if you could, uh, you would just do that all the time. But the Badgers rank 64th in, in defensive explosiveness allowed. That's 67th against the pass and 60th against the run. So it's kind of not a great deal of difference there in terms of how teams have been able to get them. Uh, But you're getting a little less resistance through the year. That happens to be Nebraska's strength so far on offense this year. Can Nebraska get creative to find some of those plays? Could come in the option game. Most likely probably comes in the pass game. Wide receiver Samori Toure. It's 282 yards away from 1,000 against the two defenses Nebraska is going to face from here on out. It's going to be, it would be a major surprise if he got there. But um, if he does, it would also not be a major surprise if if Nebraska went 2-0 over those games. What a finish that would be. But it's more than just Toure. 
which I think is kind of the key to Nebraska's explosiveness in the passing game this year. Austin Allen has been over 15 yards per catch with multiple catches in four games this year. He's kind of emerged, particularly during this middle to last third of, of Nebraska's season. We've seen wide receivers Omar Manning and Xavier Betts have their moments. They can hurt teams with big plays down the field. All of Nebraska's best options for big plays, sort of shortcuts to to go back to something we talked about earlier this season on the podcast, shortcut to points, um, are in the passing game. And you can probably include running back Ramir Johnson there when it comes to big plays. He's had a couple recently uh, through the passing game. Getting them in the run game has been not quite as frequent for, for him and probably won't be against defenses like Wisconsin and Iowa. So it really comes down to, for me, can Nebraska hit some big plays in the passing game? To do that, it's it's going to have to provide Adrian Martinez some time, which has been an ongoing struggle. Nebraska's big picture struggle, I guess, for, for the Frost era to this point, has been winning the majority of plays yet still finding ways to lose games. This Wisconsin game is at least a little bit potentially freeing in that regard because you go in knowing it's probably not going to win the majority of plays. Opposing offenses are only, quote-unquote, winning 30% against Wisconsin this to this point. So Nebraska really has to pack a lot into whatever share of plays it can wrestle away from the Badgers. That's going to be the key. Big plays, how big are they? Um, you know, a 20-yard pass play certainly counts as an explosive play, but if it doesn't lead to points, um, that's kind of the Badgers game. Third key for Saturday, Nebraska probably has to be turnover-free. It could maybe get away with one, but turnover-free is... <laughs> Is the, the surest way I think the Huskers stay in this, which if you listen to this show often, you'll know I don't like to to bring up turnovers a whole lot because they're they're pretty uncontrollable. But it's black and white here. Wisconsin's turnaround from one and three to now seven and three isn't too tough to explain. First, the Badgers got back to their core competency on offense, namely running the football a lot. But the other big piece to that is turnovers. Through the first four games, Wisconsin committed 12 turnovers and forced just three. So it was minus nine at that point, and everybody had largely written off the preseason division favorite. Over the last six games, Wisconsin's committed nine turnovers, but it's forced 17, leaving it at plus eight during a six-game win streak in which it has won every game by 17 points or more. The outlier there, a 20-14 to 14 win over Army. The Black Knights fumbled just once, which is pretty good for an option team. You could almost talk yourself into it for Nebraska, right? Off week to prepare. Ron Brown's currently in charge of the backfield. He knows a bit about the option. We've seen option looks for more modern-day sets all year. And there's even that... I formation series against Ohio State from 2019. Maybe that's just in the back of the closet somewhere. All the pieces are there. It's the end of the season and there's nothing to lose. So the incentive is there. Could Nebraska? Nah. But it's fun to dream. As Frost was talking about over the past two weeks about his decision to let go of the majority of the assistance on that side of the ball and talking about what he look what he'll be looking for in the offense going forward once we are past these next two games i think it became pretty clear that we're not talking about wholesale changes here um, and i don't think there should be you know there's enough here with nebraska's offense maddening as it can be at times to show that I mean, it really does come down to to a handful of plays a lot of the time. They'll put up yards with anybody. It just hasn't produced the points that you would think it should. As we look to Nebraska's future 
it's, it's kind of fun to you. Fun to think about what it could be, what it will be, what it needs to be. But on Saturday, it's pretty simple. Nebraska, when it has the football, one, needs to maintain possession of the football. Easier said than done, particularly of late against this defense. Um, but two, it needs to do what it does. And it's kind of a, well, not kind of, it's, it's entirely an interesting spot in my mind. Um, Frost has always been, I believe, the, the primary play caller this year with Lubick. It was a little bit confusing, I guess, would be the word to, to use about exactly how play calling duties and game planning and all that stuff was broken down. But there's no question going into this game. There's, there's Frost and there's Becton. And then there's a bunch of guys who, you know, three weeks ago, weren't allowed to work directly with players during practice by NCAA rule. Now they are. So what are we going to see? I'm not exactly sure. I think Nebraska, it, it has an opportunity here to kind of make a statement. It's not going to get the Huskers to a bowl game. Uh, it's not going to do any of these things other than end the season on a positive note. Because right now to this point, you can look at the power ratings and I do every week. Uh, you can look at all of that stuff. You can look at the bizarre record in, in one score games and say, yeah, this is, this is as good. I think as Nebraska has been during the frost era, wasn't good enough to prevent wide scale changes on the offensive staff. And, and maybe that ends up being a positive, but beating Wisconsin or Iowa much less beating them both would be a way to, to grab at least a little momentum going into what's going to be a really interesting, um, probably a high tension type of off season for the Huskers. Don't take that for granted. That'll do it for the I-80 preview this week. Thanks as always for listening. If you like the show, do your podcast chores rate and review, subscribe, tell a friend, tell an enemy, and make sure you're subscribed to Hale Varsity as well. Um, we're moving into holiday gift giving season. Uh, we do have gift options available for the Husker fan in your life or get one for yourself. Um, in addition to podcasts like this, you'll get 10 monthly issues of the magazine, our annual football yearbook in June, which is a nearly 200 page extravaganza designed only to, to get you ready for the football season ahead. You also get access to all of our premium content online. And there is a cornucopia to use a seasonal term, I believe of things happening right now with volleyball in the home stretch football, obviously in the home stretch, but a lot of intrigue to come just with the football program itself, as it looks for these new, new assistant coaches and basketball is going on both sides. Mark Manning's wrestling team uh, enters the year with high expectations. So there's going to be a lot on HaleVarsity.com and in your mailbox if you're a subscriber. Make sure that you are. You can visit HaleVarsity.com slash subscribe uh, to find all of the various subscription options that we have there. Thanks again. A Huda Media Production.